look out at your finger? Uh, no, I'm just... Oh, okay. Thinking, okay now we're, we're officially starting here. Okay. We're talking today with Mr. John DeVoer of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, John, can you start us off with some background on yourself? And to begin with, uh, where and when were you born? I was born in Patterson, New Jersey, in Eastside High School. And I graduated from Eastside High School, I'm sorry. Yeah, and what year were you born? I was born in 1924. Okay. And I graduated uh, from uh, Patterson Eastside when I was 16, I, I, uh, just before I turned 17. Okay. Uh, and then uh, right after that, the war started. Right. Now, what did, you, what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? Well, it was during the Depression. And my father, he worked on a bread truck, and he had a license, electric, electrician's license. Mm -hmm. So he uh, made extra money on the side, and I used to help him when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, my mother worked in a grocery store, but other than that, that's it. And we're, they were lucky to have employment yeah. in those days. And they are. So we got through the Depression, uh, and uh, that was an experience. And uh, I don't know how far you want to go into that, but... Well, if you've got things that really kind of stand out in your mind about that, go ahead and talk about it. Well, like uh, families would break up. And uh, we took one of my nieces, uh, cousins I should say, mm -hmm. and she came to live with us. And that was common. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they would uh, just break up the family and send if they had four kids, each, each child went to a different uh, home. Mm -hmm. And that worked out fine. And then I got through the Depression and I uh, graduated from high school, as I said. Right. And, and what were you planning to do then once you were out of high school? Uh, I go to work, because that's what every, most, most everybody went to work back mm -hmm. then. And uh, I ended up uh, as a tool design apprentice, working with uh, Germans who were German nationals and came to this country, but they could not work, per se, in a defense plant. Mm -hmm. So they, they worked in like job shops, which I became part of, and they taught me a lot. It was a good, good bunch of guys. Okay. And, and did you know anything about what they thought about Hitler and the Nazis and all of that? No, they never said anything. Okay. Nope. But uh, I sustained some of the friendships for a long time, but of course a lot of them have passed on. Mm -hmm. And that was a good experience because uh, I was pretty good at math and a big part of it was doing math. Okay. Now at this time, you, know, you're, you finish high school, you go to work before Pearl Harbor, were you paying much attention to the news in the world? There was a war going on in Europe, all that? Yeah, you got the news basically through Life magazine and a radio. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was no TV, so uh, that's how you got the news. And at that age, I paid a little attention, but not a great deal. Sure. But uh, the wake-up call was Pearl Harbor. <laughs> how did you hear about Pearl Harbor? I was riding in my friend's car, and he had a car radio, and that's when I heard it. Mm -hmm. it they had just bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, of course, I realized then that my life would change, mm -hmm. but I didn't enlist right away because I was only 17. But as soon as I turned 18, I did. Okay. All right, and then which branch of the service did you choose? The Navy. Okay. Yeah. And why did you pick the Navy? Because uh, I didn't like marching. <laughs> Reasonable enough. Uh, I don't know, had, did you have any experience uh, with boats or anything like that when you were growing up? Or? No, not really. Not, not in my family. We didn't, nobody had a boat. and mm -hmm. uh, I did not. I just uh, was interested in the, in the Navy and mm -hmm. what was happening. Okay. All right. And now, so when did you actually enlist? When do you start? Uh, I enlisted in February, as I said, of 43. Uh, right. And uh, you want me to get... yeah. I uh, was sent to Samson, New York, to boot camp. And 
from boot camp, I went to radio school. Okay. Well, radio. describe boot camp a little bit. What did you do there? Well, it was like a breaking down process, uh, changing your mentality. Uh, the best experience I can tell you about is sitting in a dental chair completely naked. And uh, that, that I will never forget. All right. Because you walked into this room and they put a cardboard cart in front of you and you stripped. And everybody did the same thing, put all your clothes in that box. And from then on, they marched it first to the dentist, then the psychiatrist, and then you got umpteen shots. The last thing you got was clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was an experience. When I go to the dentist, I'd say, I bet nobody ever saw it in your chair naked. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I had not heard that one before. So, so yeah. what was the base where you, they were doing this? Sampson, New York. Okay, and where is that in New York? Uh, Lake Geneva. Okay. Near, uh, I, I guess near uh, Troy or one of those places up there. Okay, but it's upstate, it's not down there. Yeah, and that's, uh, from there I went to radio school, right, right from there. Okay. Well, how long did the boot camp last? Oh, that was like, uh, I, my guess is maybe about six weeks, something okay. like that. And, then, and aside from just breaking people down and teaching them to obey orders, uh, what else did they teach you there? Uh, Basically, that's it. I, I don't remember anything okay. special. All right, uh, but then go on into radio school. How did that? Where was that, and how did that work? I was in Sampson, the same okay. same place. Same place. I mean, different part of the base. Mm -hmm. And uh, I you know if I applied for that, I I ended up there anyway, and came out with a uh, second class radio uh, position, and uh, that was basically copying Morse code. Okay. And five-letter word groups, you didn't know anything that was going on. Uh, the person that did the breakdown of the code knew there was a message. But other than that, uh, the co person that copied the code only copied was five-letter word groups. Okay. And now how hard was it to learn to do that? Uh, that, that part came pretty easy. I, I, um, I guess to back up a little bit, I was always interested a little bit in radio. Mm -hmm. the, the difficult thing about being a radio operator is sending uh, transmitted because uh, you know, copying is it's automatic, your fingers hit the keys on the typewriter, but when you're sending a message, it takes a lot of thought and you got to know what you're doing. But you don't, obviously, uh, out at sea you don't send messages because mm -hmm. Uh, you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Well, somebody's sending messages, but it's not you. Not me. Yeah. All right. Now, the was there an expectation? Did you have to hit a certain speed in terms of how quickly you could do this? Uh, to receive? Yes. yes. To receive, the, uh, they kept building up the speed and uh, to of those five-letter word groups, and uh, you had to pass that, All right. that limit. And then, were there a lot of people who couldn't get their speed up? No, I don't know of any, I don't remember anybody not doing that. Okay, so they could do that part. Now, what made transmitting messages difficult? The fact that you're using a key and not typing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you're thinking uh, about the code, like for, uh, what the letter is for, like N is da-da-da and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You have to, that's Got to, that has to be automatic in your brain, that, mm -hmm. and that's how you send. Okay. But like I said, we did almost no sending because in, uh, transmitting can be picked up by anybody. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and about how long did you spend in radio school? I'd say about uh, another six weeks at least because I left there in June. So I'm talking about February. To June, you know, mm -hmm. break that up into two. It's right. Uh, yeah, so you're basically March, April, May for full months, and then yeah. a little bit on either side. So somewhere six, eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, once you finish with that, uh, what do you do next? Then I was uh, assigned to the USS John D. Edwards, the, the destroyer. Okay. Now, and destroyer. That we had a lot of destroyers. What type of destroyer was it? How old was it? It was built in 1919. Uh, which makes it pretty old. Mm -hmm. Carried uh, one four-inch gun, uh, about 
seven or eight torpedoes, a lot of depth charges, and a lot of anti-aircraft -air guns. Basically, that's the armament, and uh, you used it as, as you needed it. Okay. Uh, now, well, where did you join it? In uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. It was in dry dock, and uh, I guess center board that thing, and they were working on it in, in dry dock, and we're chipping hammers. You just can't sleep. Were you, did, were you sleeping on the ship at that point? Yeah. So while it's in dry dock, you're still staying there. Trying to. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we were there. We weren't there very long. The interesting thing I started have to tell you is that uh, I went aboard a uh, ship in I said June, mm -hmm. and I came home for about a two or three day leave. And the the father of the kid next door said, "What ship are you on?" He, I lived in an Italian neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I said J.D. Edwards. Well, it turns out that his son, Ignatz Floridia, was on the same ship I was, mm -hmm. which is very unusual. Yeah. You have to think of, of all the maiden guys. And he was a chief cook. And as we go through this thing, I'll tell you what a difficult job that was. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but in the meantime, you found out because how many men were in the crew, do you think? Overall? Yeah. Oh God! I'd say a couple of million, maybe. Well, in the crew. Oh, in the crew, 120. Yeah. Okay. And 12 officers. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's not plus or minus. They vary. Some some guys that leave, some others take over. Right. But but not very many men. So to have a, a, one of your neighbors on the same ship was was sort of yeah. Unusual. That's right. That's very unusual. Okay. So you go off for a couple of days, and then you come back, um, and then do you go out to sea, or what happens next? What happened after that uh, first trip was to Trinidad, and uh, I was assigned to uh, Radio Shack, and being cooped up inside uh, out at sea, I got seasick mm -hmm. pretty bad. But I stayed at my position <laughs> and uh, got through that. And then after that, I never got seasick again. We went to Trinidad, and I had shore patrol in Trinidad. Okay. Now, when you went to Trinidad, were you going as a convoy escort or by yourself? No, we were by ourselves. Okay. But we always uh, had sonar gear on, mm -hmm. and always looking for submarines. Right. Okay. And then you said you got down to Trinidad, and then you had shore patrol duty? Yeah. Okay, what happened there? What was that like? Well, I, I was armed with a club, and went into uh, the bad section of... Uh, Sure to that, and my job was to keep servicemen out of there. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was, I was glad when that was over. But that, that was my experience in Trinidad. Okay. Now, did you do that as part of a team, or did you go by yourself? There's another fellow and myself, the two of us. Okay. Now, and they come around and check on you with a jeep once in a while. Mm -hmm. So you were just like a foot patrol. You were just out there. That's all. No jeep. You're just out there someplace. In a hand club. Okay. And so you're just watching who's passing by on the street? Yeah, you have to make sure no sailors got, got in there. Okay. A lot of them had died uh, in there. Okay. So it really was a bad part of town? It was. Okay. Uh, and did the other guy, did he have any more experience than you did? No, or? we're the same. Oh, yeah. You send the new guys out there. We could, both couldn't wait till it was over. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then after Trinidad, what do you do next? After Trinidad, uh, we continued on uh, south, went to uh, Brazil, I think it was, received Brazil, crossed mm -hmm. the equator, which is an experience. And, what what uh, did they do when you crossed the equator for the first time? Oh, yeah. But what they did, uh, until you cross the equator, you're a polywog, and then once you cross, you're a shellback. Well, they have a procedure, uh, pictures of that you go through, and they have this... Uh, round thing you had to crawl through and they filled with garbage. Anything to make you miserable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you go into a, a tub and they keep dunking, in, dunking you into the tub until you have a shell back. And then they come out and now you have a shell back. But it was just uh, mm -hmm. no, no big deal. Yeah. That kind of breaks up the monotony of being oh, yeah. on the ship it a was, long time. 
It was an experience. Okay. And now, were you still cruising by yourself, or did you have other ships around? We were, we were pretty much by ourselves, except if we refueled off a tank or something like that. Okay. Um, like we, uh, that was quite common. We had to refuel at sea, and then food-wise, we we did not have refrigeration. Mm -hmm. uh, by that I mean a refrigerator per se. We had an ice box, and once the ice was depleted, then we eat uh, dehydrated food. That's why I felt sorry for Ignatz. Mm -hmm. He had to come up with something. <laughs> All right. Well, now with the, now with the dehydrated food, do you have to carry fresh water, or could you process water? We made made fresh water out of seawater. Okay. They had condensers, and uh, that's what we used too for showers. And uh, it, it was an old being an old ship. It was a lot of old ideas. That, for example, if you wanted hot water, you got cold water, but then put steam in it, mm -hmm. hot live steam. That's how they heated the water. All right. Uh, now, what kind of quarters did you have on the ship? I slept in the after quarters, which uh, uh, I had a bottom bunk of three, three, uh, in a, uh, and slept above the magazine where all the shells were, and my feet were against a fuel tank. Mm -hmm. So, so if you got torpedoed, you'd go right away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now. Um, this is so. This was sort of kind of summer into fall of for, late late latter half of forty three. That yeah, you're on these cruises at this stage. Summer, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and was the weather good, or did you get storms? Or no, we didn't have any bad weather uh, on that trip. Uh, we did later on uh, when we go into Europe and the Mediterranean. Right. But, uh, okay. that, that trip was not bad at all. Okay. Uh, and did you have a lot of new crewmen on that, or just a few of you? A lot of what? A new crewman. New guys like yourself. Oh, new new crew. Yeah, yeah. There's always a rotation. And uh, in fact, we had a skipper that uh, they relieved the command. You know what that means. We got a new skipper sometime during that process, and uh, it changed. Uh, our skipper we had originally was a, a lieutenant commander. It's a two and a half striper. Mm -hmm. And we ended up with a plain lieutenant, which I shouldn't say plain lieutenant, with a lieutenant. And that made us junior ship in the squadron, so everybody else had a higher rank. Mm -hmm. And did you have any idea of why they had relieved the first commander? Uh, I probably shouldn't put this on camera, but I would have relieved them too. Because uh, he, he had great difficulty docking the ship. Okay. And uh, of course, he used line throwing guns and that kind of thing. But when you change the command, you always wonder about the guy that's taken over. Mm -hmm. And this fellow, uh, this lieutenant that took over, he was good. He he handled that like it was an 18 foot sea ray. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he could really handle that ship. He'd pull that right in, next to the dock, and they could almost walk over with the lights. Okay. Now, about how old do you think he was? Oh, I'd say he's in the thirties, forties. So he's not a, he's not a kid. But no. I guess a, a lieutenant is. I mean, that that's higher than an army lieutenant in terms of the actual level you're at. Yeah, no, it's a, it's lieutenant and navy is just two stripes. You go ensign lieutenant. No. Yeah. Well, there's lieutenant junior grade, and then there's a regular lieutenant above that. He was an interesting guy. He uh, always had an automatic weapon and uh, fired everything that floated by. All right. Uh, so now you got a, you got a new skipper and so forth. So was this first cruise in a way kind of like a shakedown cruise almost, kind of getting guys you know working together? That's a good point. I, I don't know why we went to receive Brazil, but, uh, other than looking for submarines. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say maybe because we had changed. They changed the stacks from four to three. Mm -hmm. uh, that. I don't know. Okay, so they had that, that overhaul and dry dock. They were converting the ship from being a, a traditional four stacker, four smokestacks in line, to which three. was to, to three. And that's, and was there any reason to do that? Yeah, I never found out. I, in my own mind, I said this is confuse the enemy. Right. Because that was a very distinctive profile of a ship, and if they didn't yeah. see that, they wouldn't know what it was. Like, like I said on that picture, that ship saw a lot of action in the South Pacific. 
at the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So you made the first cruise. Do you go back to Charleston or you go somewhere else? No. We uh, our home port was uh, I think it was Casco Bay, Maine. Okay. We weren't from right down south at the Casco Bay, Maine. That's that's two extremes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, and then so you put in there after that first cruise. Pardon? After going down to Brazil, did you go all the way back up to Maine? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, from uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then did you stay there very long, or just? Well, only for supplies and uh, whatever, and uh, link up with other ships because we did convoy duty, that kind of thing. Okay. So, talk, and so was that the next voyage you went on? Was convoy escort? We did some convoy duty over to uh, the, the Mediterranean, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, and then uh, yeah, that that was about it. Convoy duty, and we we did some alone. We did a lot of uh, cruising uh, along the East Coast because there were a lot of submarines out mm -hmm. there at that time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, let's see. What describe a little bit what what the convoy duty was like, or what you remember about some of those trips? Oh, well, there was a lot of freighters and that kind of thing, and our duty was to uh, be on the outside of the convoy and uh, use the sonar to look for uh, uh, submarines, get okay. sonar pickups. Now, the first time you went with a convoy, was that going to England or down to the Mediterranean? That was over to the Med. Okay. Yeah. All right. And did anything happen on that trip, or was no, it quiet? No, nothing. No. Okay. Now, at this point in the war, you know, you had destroyers. What else did you have to escort convoys with? They, I think they used some light cruisers, but uh, basically it was just what we call tin cans. Okay. But you didn't have aircraft carriers with you, or not at that time. Okay. Uh, th that came later with the uh, what they call ASW anti submarine warfare, mm -hmm. and you had they. Put a flight deck on uh, freighters, like right. water canal. Yeah, they converted ships to make small yeah. carriers. Because in the middle of the Atlantic, there were areas where our aircraft couldn't provide you with air cover. Right. Okay. The the aircraft sometimes carried uh, toward the end of my time aboard ship, they would drop sonar boys in the water that would send signals back to the aircraft. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's it. It's very secretive. Because we got pretty good at the anti-submarine warfare after a oh, while. Oh, we did, yeah. Okay. Uh, now that okay, so the first trip is fairly quiet. Where did you go in the Mediterranean? We went to uh, Tunisia. Okay. I think is a town, but Bizzardi. Bizzardi, yeah. yeah. Bizzardi. We went to Bizzardi, and uh, of course stopped at Gibraltar and that kind of thing. All right. And once you got into the Mediterranean, did you encounter any U-boats or other problems? No, we uh, we were attacked by. JU-88s, which okay. a German bomber, yeah. and uh, fortunately he missed us, but we missed him too. Yeah. <laughs> well, was he going for you or was he going for the merchant ship? That's a good point. I kind of suspect he's going for the ship because, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the freighters. Mm -hmm. The Germans were trying to uh, stop Malta from being supplied. and. Uh, They uh, they needed oil bad, mm -hmm. and that was their way to get it. You know, take over the med. Yeah, although by then we had kicked them out of North Africa and Sicily, and were yeah, that was coming to an end. Yeah. yeah, but they still had, but they were still in the northern half of Italy, and they still had aircraft based out there. That's right. They could still harass you. Malta was a became a very important island. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was that particularly before. We kicked them out of North Africa. That's right. I um, mean, afterward, it wasn't as big a deal, but uh, but it was still it was still the target, and you were still supplying it, and it was yes. still a base. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, do you remember? Did you when you went through the Straits of Gibraltar? Did you actually get to look out and see that, or were you just inside the radio shack? Oh, I got out to see it. Yeah, went ashore. Okay. Uh, picked up some souvenirs, which I don't have most of them anymore. I, I, I'm not a collector. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so at, at this point, uh, now now you've got you've got your, your your new skipper. The crew has some experience. Did the crew get along pretty well? Oh, very well. Yeah. It was. Uh, 
we had a good uh, good crew, I thought. And we uh, had 120 guys in. And we, uh, like I said, I slept in the after crew's quarters. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at that picture, to get from the uh, forward deck house, which we call the galley deck house, to the after deck house, you have to get into the after deck house to the crew's quarters. So they had a uh, like a cable that ran down with bus straps on, mm -hmm. and when water was breaking over the deck, you grabbed that strap and ran down the deck. Mm -hmm. You have to undog the hatch. Get inside, get it dog together before the next wave hit. Right. Otherwise, everybody down below gets wet, and that's that's not good. Okay. Now, now, what was it like to be on that ship in a storm? Well, in a bad storm, we uh, just ate sandwiches mm -hmm. uh, and uh, did rock and roll and moved. To, very, you have to be very careful that you don't get washed overboard. Mm -hmm. And uh, just just moved a lot. That's all. Did you worry that the ship was going to sink or capsize? No, I never or? worried about that. Okay. No. But it, it just never came to my mind. Because right. it seemed to be kind of a frightening thing if you're... Oh, yeah. You know, and maybe too, too scared to worry about it. But you get used to that. Okay. Pretty much. We had some rough weather. And I think I got a picture there of mm -hmm. the, going into the next wave. And what happens is when you go into that down that trough and into the wave. Now the ship's lifting all that water. And the screws are out of them, come out of the water. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they make that noise. So that's uh, that's an experience. All right. Uh, now, I'm sorry, the, the, the important thing is a roll. You don't want to go over X number of degrees, uh, otherwise you capsize. Yeah. So as long as you're facing in the right direction, you know, against the waves or with them. You have to have a good helmsman. Somebody knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Now, um, so you have a Mediterranean cruise. Uh, you said you also took convoys over to England. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and now, I guess, and when you North went to Africa. England. Okay, in North Africa. Okay. Yep. So, so what ports did you wind up stopping at while you were with the destroyer? Casablanca, I guess. So uh, I said Bazoli mm -hmm. and uh, Azores. Uh, interesting thing, Azores uh, that was a neutral country. Mm -hmm. So you're limited how many times you can visit. Uh, and I, uh, they're very fussy about that. And we used to try to pull into the Azores for food, these vegetables and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, other than that, the uh, Azores and then be the home Bermuda, uh, then the home, home ports along the east coast, uh, Costco Bay, Maine, Boston, uh, as I said, Charleston, Norfolk. Yeah. Norfolk was a big Navy place. All right. Uh, of the different places that you visited, did you have a favorite or a place that you kind of liked best? Uh, no, I just, uh, from a memory point of thing, I think uh, either Boston or uh, Costco, Costco Bay. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you're in service, you like liberties, and you could always, always have a good liberty in the Boston. Yeah. I don't know that there would be much to do in Casco Bay. No, that, that's quite a quiet place. <laughs> but it was nice. We we always anchored out in the bay, and it was a long uh, whaleboat ride mm -hmm. into the dock. And it was colder than anything. You, you can imagine how cold that gets in the wintertime. But uh, it was kind of a fun thing mm -hmm. to get ashore. To tell you the truth, I was always happy to leave port and get out, out to sea again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, did any of the convoys you were with uh, have encounters with U-boats? Did, did any of the convoys you were with, did you run into U-boats? Very, uh, well, see, the thing is, if you get a sound hit, uh, to get a confirmed uh, sinking, you have to really prove it, Right. that, that you sank it. 
and we had a lot of contacts, mm -hmm. and he dropped a lot of depth charges. But uh, whether the U-boats just got away or what, right? Because they're tracking you as well as they're tracking them. Mm -hmm. And I never had a, an experience where we just dropping uh, depth charges got a U-boat. No, right. Uh, but were you involved in some successful U-boat hunts or chases? The uh, the one with the U-544. And of course, my involvement was being aboard the destroyer. Right. I can't say I took any credit. The yeah. pilots are the ones that sank it. And uh, as I said, we were sent back to look for survivors. Okay. Well, let's back up the story a little bit now. Were you, you so you, were, you had your destroyer, there were other ships, there was a light aircraft carrier there? Yeah, the uh, we had the uh, Guadalcanal, yes, mm -hmm. Guadalcanal, which is, a, as I said, a converted Liberty ship, and uh, that was it. The Guadalcanal and Ford destroyers. Right. So you were a submarine hunting group, really. Yes. Okay. Primarily, and that's what the planes did. They they took off and uh, always dropped things in the water, and also they're always looking for submarines, and they they did a good job doing that. Particularly toward the end of the war, after when they sank, when we, when we sank the U-544, we were told in the morning that uh, this sub was going to be refueling, and where, mm -hmm. exact time, location, and it's because uh, some intelligence officer broke the Enigma code. Right. So, so that's how they captured the U-505. We were reading their mail, and they didn't know it. So. It, that's right. Oh. All right. So yeah. So you, but okay. You were told okay that there. So before you actually encountered it, you were told it was going to be out there. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And like then, there was uh, two subs refueling off another sub. Mm-hmm. And did you take? Did you just sink the one sub, or did you get? Yeah, all that's yeah. You confirmed one. The other ones were the damaged or what? Don't know. But the only confirmed sinking was a U five forty forty four. And uh, that was definite. Okay. And was that sunk by the aircraft? Yeah, yes. Yeah, the aircraft, they carried depth charges and bombs and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. All right. And then did your ship find any survivors from that? No, we did not. We were sent to look and found none. No survivors. Okay. Now, was it under, do you know if it, the ship was, if the U boat was underwater when it was hit? No, I think they were on a on a surface. Okay. With uh, as a story, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they got caught and couldn't couldn't, couldn't survive. Die. The time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, let's see. Um, did the U-boats ever sink anything in no. the convoys you were with? No. Okay. Never. Not not in my experience. All right. Uh, now, did you go ashore at all in Europe? Only in Casablanca and Bizzoli. Because that's still Africa, so... In Africa, yeah. But you didn't land in England, or...? No, uh, we got close, but never tied up in England. Okay. But if you got most of the way across, but you just refuel off of oilers, and then We refueled back? off of tankers, yeah. or, or, or off the carrier. Okay. And that's quite an involved process, refueling. Because uh, you have to go at the right speed, and, uh, and uh, you don't want to... Pull the hoses out. Of. In fact, that you remember I told you this skipper we had. We were a junior ship, so we were always the last to refuel. And a skipper on a tanker got on a bullhorn. He said, "You might be junior ship, but you made the best approach." <laughs> <laughs> so, what would you actually have to do to refuel the ship? Well, you throw the lines over, and then eventually you. Know, like I said, you had to get it the right distance, the right speed, and then pull the hoses over and refuel and keep it that way mm -hmm. so you don't pull the hose out of the, because uh, that fuel oil made a big mess. Right. And then, uh, well, as we, when we picked up the three flyers, uh, we sent the flyers back by a buoy line and, uh, Back to the carrier. And they used to send us food while we refueled. Mm -hmm. So did they have refrigeration on their ship? Oh yeah, it was a 
pretty new tanker. I mean, a uh, freighter. Yeah. But uh, they were more up to date than we were. We were uh, so old. Right. Okay. Now you mentioned incident of rescuing flyers. Can you talk about what happened there? With what? Rescuing flyers. Oh, about yeah. What happened was the uh, they sank the U-544. And there were three planes left in the air. And the first of the three tried to land on the car, and as I said, he got a wave off, and he crashed on the deck. Well, by the time they got the plane pushed over the side, it was dark. And landing on a car in the daytime is a challenge. At nighttime, it's really difficult. Because uh, the, the deck, is, the perimeter is, it had like a fluorescent lights on, but they only turn them on on a, on a final approach. So uh, the other two were given permission to pancake alongside the stirrers, and one guy came in alongside ours. It was a fairly rough sea, and uh, these guys got out of the plane, and they uh, were screaming, and I, one of my shipmates tied a line around his waist, waist and dove into water, kept them all together, and then we got them back aboard ship. Mm -hmm. now, did they have life vests? Or did they yeah. Have, yeah. But, you know, in the ocean, that ain't last so long. Yeah. And, and also, and you, get sep you get separated, yeah. you know, that's the last thing you want to happen. Mm -hmm. So we kept them all together and yeah, they kept them back. Right. Now, did the um, escort carriers, did they have a lot of problems losing aircraft? Oh, yeah. The, the, the first trip, uh, the trip that I got there, we lost uh, half the planes and, and crews. And uh, we went back to the States to uh, replenish uh, mm -hmm. the planes and crew. I, I, that's when I, our ship left the squadron, or left the uh, task group. Mm -hmm. And then they, uh, that's, that's, next trip was the one they got the 505. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, so the same group that you were with, with then later captured the U-505? Yes. Okay. Yes. But, your, but what was your ship doing then? Because you're not with them, so what were you doing? What were we, we were, uh... Were you on the some, East Coast again, or...? Yeah, we're back in the Caribbean, okay. looking for subs and that kind of thing. Some convoy duty. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, we're relieved of that. All right. Uh, now, you, you mentioned that you, you had your neighbor from, from home who was yeah. the, the chief cook. Uh, did, did that ever do you any good? I mean, could he sneak you anything good out of the kitchen, or did they not have anything? No, no, uh, there was no favoritism okay. there. No, no, not, the, not that I was aware of. Not, no, I'd have to say no to that. Okay. Yeah. I felt sorry for him because, you know, he didn't have no refrigeration speak of, it's not easy to put a meal together. And he, there was a lot of criticism of him. Mm -hmm. but what, could they, what could he do? Right. Cause so I, I, I told you about the cable. Mm -hmm. Well, we always ate in the cruise quarters. And uh, the, we had a mess attendant who would go to the galley deck house and they had five trains with a handle on top. And he they would be filled with food, and then he would come out of the galley and grab that strap, run like a kind of deck, try and get in, undog the hatch, get in, and try not to get wet. Mm -hmm. That was a challenge. Wow. Because he had to get the food in there too. Yeah, he just himself. Because you only know, have two, one, when you have to hold the strap, yeah. the other you got the food. Uh, he was, he was a mess attendant. And the, Unlike every other ship in the Navy, they met, the rest of the ships ate off metal trays mm -hmm. with partitions, not us, we had China. And of course it didn't last, mm -hmm. and they, I don't know where they got all the China from, but it'd be sliding off the table and mm -hmm. hitting the deck and breaking, and it was unusual. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was left over from... It was probably left over from something they decided to use it. Yeah. All right. Uh, now. Now, you eventually leave the destroyer and, and, and take on a different assignment. Okay, what happened was I always I had a urine to fly. So I uh, put in for flight training, and uh, 
this captain I was telling you, the skipper, the tooth striper, he called me up there very he said, son, I'm going to sign this thing, but I think you're crazy. <laughs> he said, look at those guys. You know, they're not, life isn't worth a nickel. Mm -hmm. But I went, you know, I got in a flight train. You know, I left the ship in, I think, uh, Charleston or someplace like that. Okay. And, and when did you leave the ship? Oh, God, let's see. It had to be in 40, late 44. Late 44. Or okay. Like All right. Then I got into flying. Mm -hmm. All right. And where did they send you for the first stage of the flight training? Okay. I went to Murray University in Kentucky for a couple of courses. And then from there I went to the University of Georgia for some more. And then uh, from there I went to pre what they call pre-flight in Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. And that's when you actually, actually learn to fly. Now, why were they having you take college courses? Beats me. Uh, I studied phys physics mm -hmm. and uh, some other subjects. Yeah. I was in uh, Murray. And the interesting thing is, uh, when you uh, when you went to class, you marched in a group, and you went in and uh, you, you're assigned a seat at the desk, and you had a, a monitor at the door, and he he'd say, "Attention, professor, would come in. Everybody would stand up until he said be seated." <laughs> they don't do that now. No. <laughs> well, maybe they do at West Point. Things are different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly not where I am. And then uh, after class. You went to mess, and then back to uh, the dorm, and uh, you had to study with lights out at 9.30, and no no going out or anything like that. It was just strictly work. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a good idea. All right. Now, and then at the University of Georgia, what were you doing there? I studied navigation and the survival. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm, basically, uh, uh, relaxation, uh, how to sleep, uh, especially if you're flying a lot, and a couple other courses. Something to keep you go, keep you alive, you know? right? Right. So, what did the survival training consist of? The survival training uh, taught you uh, uh, how to build snares. Uh, Basically, how to survive in the, in, if you're, you're down somewhere, mm -hmm. and uh, taught you how to uh, protect yourself against the enemy. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat was big. Wore padded clothing. And, uh, you know, and the instructor sent somebody after you with a club mm -hmm. or a knife or something, you ought to protect yourself. But that's, that was a survival. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then after that, that's when you start the pre-flight. I started pre-flight in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I soloed before any of my other shipmates did, for some dumb reason. I, he surprised me one day, he got out, the, the instructor. And he said, okay, take off, so I, you know, I, I felt like I said, you really need it? <laughs> All right. But then I, uh, I loved that. Okay. Well, what did they do to prepare you for, for that, the solo? What did you do before the solo flight? It was mostly, I would say, the actual part of flying was mostly a hands-on thing. Mm -hmm. The preparation is, uh, of course, is navigation. That, that, that's another sub right. whole subject. But uh, yeah, it was interesting. But, but they got you in the aircraft pretty quickly. They did. But with an instructor with you. Always with an instructor, mm -hmm. except uh, when you solo. Right. And uh, that was an experience I'll never forget. Okay. Now, what kind of aircraft were you in? It was a Stearman biplane. Okay. And uh, I, we taught all kinds of aerobatics, uh, how to do uh, approaches uh, like. They would have uh, flare pots set up at night time. You had to set it down within the first four flare pots. And also they had uh, what they call a S turns to a circle. 
there would be circles on a field, and you'd have to, with your with a check pilot or the instructor, and you'd come around and you have to land, set it down in that circle. That's a challenge. Okay. Now, what was the purpose of that kind of thing? Uh, for carrier landings, basically. You know, you have to have good judgment. Okay. Now, how did the first solo flight go? Uh, I was surprised. I, I was scared, and I uh, I overshot the field a little bit, and I was worried I was going to run out of runway. But of course, I, it was a grass field. Mm -hmm. But I uh, I stopped in time, and then after that, I never. I was coming in too high. That was the problem. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Uh, now then, after that first solo flight, now what happens? Well, you learn a lot of aerobatics and uh, maneuvers, that kind of thing. Uh, that's that's the nice part. Flying straight in the level is pretty boring, mm -hmm. but when you can do aerobatics, uh, that's that's fun. Okay. Now, uh, now, when was it that you did that solo flight? That was in. Uh, hmm. We made it to forty-five now. I was thinking forty-five. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Because uh, I got out in forty-six. I. As I said, I stayed in after I could have gotten out, but because I wanted to fly. Right. How far did you wind up getting in flight training? Uh, I got about 125 hours. Okay. But I mean, did you? But you didn't get all the way to getting a commission. Oh no, no, no. But I, that was my. Uh, that would have happened uh, down the road. You no, know, maybe another six months or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, after learning to fly in a steerman, did you move to another no. level, or did you just go that no, far? No, that, that was where it ended with, with the steerman, okay. which is a basic, easy-to-fly airplane, very airworthy. Yeah. Okay, but was that the last thing you were doing while you were in the service? Or did yes. You, okay. Yep. So and that's getting there. Into... I came home. Okay. I, uh, like I said, I had originally signed an agreement to stay in five years. And then they, they said, well, if, if you change your mind and you want to leave, you can leave because the war ended. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been away from home a while, so I opted to come home. Okay. Now, are there, I guess, while you were doing the flight training and, and you're in, in Memphis, I mean, did you have some more free time or liberty than you had back when you were in the college setting? Or were well, you yeah. still? Okay. Yeah. Because there are only so many aircraft, and uh, so you have a lot of uh, we play cards, that kind of thing, and, and uh, a lot of that. And you go on deliberately and try to behave yourself. Mm -hmm. right. so that, but would you go into Memphis or? Oh yeah, yeah. That that was the uh, liberty place. Memphis it was a, it was a busy town. Now, you're in the South. I mean, the South was still segregated at that point. Did you notice that yourself? Oh, definitely. Because uh, the town next to us was Millington, 100% black. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember getting on a bus, and uh, the blacks had to sit in the back. We could sit anywhere we want in the front. And uh, that always uh, that stayed with me. It just didn't seem fair. Mm -hmm. But the whole town oh, is 100% black. Mm -hmm. And then what about in Memphis itself? Because you would have... Memphis is a mixture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there was no problem that I, I was aware of there. It's a this typical city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Now, are there any particular events or things that kind of stand out in your mind, either about the time on ship or the time when you're doing flight training that you haven't brought into the story here yet? Hmm. Well, we had some, uh, uh, we almost sank an American tug one time. Okay, how'd that happen? We were off the coast of Florida, and supposedly there were less German subs. So this is at night, and they challenged it. They'd pick something up, a mm -hmm. radar, mm -hmm. and they challenged it, and it got no response. And they challenged it again, got no response. So this time they loaded what they call star shells to light up the target, and it didn't light up very well. 
So the captain said, well, load common. And we weren't hitting anything because it was kind of a rough sea. Mm -hmm. So he says, oh, let's get in close and turn on the searchlight. We had this huge transference. And here's a big American flag on the back of this typo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I bet those guys were scared silly. Yeah. Now, when you were challenging them, you were did you use a, a blinker signal? Yeah, or? they used some kind of a light. Right. And that's a little dangerous, too, because uh, you're, you're lo giving off your location. Right. But also the tug, I don't know, did the tug not have that kind of equipment? or? I think it was a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Probably had the equipment, but didn't have the right recognition code. Mm -hmm. so. All right. A lot of friendly fire things happen. All right. Okay. Now, once you, because you, you get out of the Navy early in 46, uh, okay. now, now what do you do once you're out? Uh, I went back to work. In the, back in the tool design, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, the economy wasn't doing too good, and I uh, I was working in different job shops at tool design, and I was offered an opportunity to get in the telephone company, so I grabbed that, and uh, in the meantime I got married, and uh, had a family later. Uh, year or two later, but uh, I continued to work and uh, missed the opportunity, I should say. I didn't take advantage of the opportunity to go to college. Mm -hmm. I, when I was in the Navy in college, I was a good student, them bragging, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I was always a good student. Yeah. Although a lot of times in, in those days, if, if you could do technical work well, you, know, you really didn't need the college education. No, I was like I said, I was good at math, and that's that's a big that was a big part of tools. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And with the phone company, I mean, what were you doing? What kind of what, tool design? Well, what kind of, well, with the tele once you joined the telephone company, what oh, kind what of work I do? did you do? Oh, I was in uh, main maintenance inside in the central office. Mm -hmm. Switch working on switching equipment and that kind of thing. Okay. Now, were you doing that in New Jersey, or did you move? New Jersey. Okay. I, and then I, uh, I, after 37 years in a telephone company, I retired mm -hmm. and uh, went to work for a company called Westel and had an idea that uh, they should do things a little different. And I saved Westel from bankruptcy. They, uh, the idea that I, it was a device where you could look down a line, loop it, and send the signal back and tell whether the trouble was on a customer prem or otherwise you had a dispatch. Mm -hmm. So that saved both the telephone company a lot of money and also uh, the uh, West Hill did good. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay. And then how did you wind up in Michigan? Uh, my family lived here and we used to vacation out here. I, I have family in the East Coast here as well and mm -hmm. also, as I said, my son. He's in Asheville, and uh, but we always enjoyed coming out here, and spending time at the lake. My wife and I did, and at that time, uh, I was still working, mm -hmm. and even though I left the East Coast, uh, I still had responsibility for West Hill in the this area. Mm -hmm. But I got tired of it after a while and just quit. Mm -hmm. I said, I've had it. I, said, I got tired of traveling around. Yeah. All right. But I mean, it does sound like you did pretty well for yourself in the end. And I, 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 can't, I have no complaints. Yeah. The only complaint I have is that I didn't do what I said earlier. Yeah. I hadn't followed up on a, on a good college education. Okay. That, that was a missed opportunity. Now, when you look back at the time that you spent in the service, uh, how do you think that affected you, or what did you learn from that? Uh, discipline, for one thing, and uh, just how to survive uh, by yourself, mm -hmm. be independent. Yeah, kind of have to grow up. Yeah, have to grow up. All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing the story today. Oh, you're welcome.